Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Now, I grew up in Birmingham, and I thought I knew a thing or two about poverty. But I really did not know what poverty was about until I took a trip, a three-month trip one summer, to India. It was a typical hot, sweaty monsoon August in India. And my brothers and I, we were travelling from the north of India down to the south to learn a little bit more about our heritage. And it was on one of these many train journeys, these many hot and sweaty train journeys that we took that summer, that I met a little boy. So our train, it pulled into the station and chaos ensued. People got off, people got on, food was bought through the windows, chai was drunk, and amidst this chaos, this little boy got on. And this little boy wasn't wearing very much at all apart from blue shorts. He looked about three years old, no older than three years old to me. And he was carrying a jaru, which is an Indian brush, you've probably seen it with loads of sticks. And as the train started to pull away out of the station, this little boy, he squatted down and he silently started to brush the water from the floor of the train, the monsoon rainwater. And he silently worked from one end of the carriage to the other. Nobody else seemed to see this little lad, but I couldn't take my eyes off him although he was invisible to most people on the train, who were basically used to seeing a child so young working for a bit of food or a bit of money. This wasn't normal to me. My mind was racing. Where was his mother? Why was he alone on the train? What if he got hurt? What if he got lost? How is he going to get home? Was nobody worried about him? And then he proceeded to finish, and then he went round asked for a bit of money, any food he could get, and then he proceeded to move off into the next carriage. The little boy was gone. But unfortunately for me, or should I say fortunately for me, he has never left me. He remains with me every day, and he is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons I do what I do. In a world, our world, for me, it's just unacceptable that a little, a little child should be forced to put themselves in danger on a daily basis for a little bit of food and a little bit of money. It's just unacceptable. But yet, but yet, every day, young children all over the world, millions of children, put themselves in this situation to put food on their table, to feed themselves or their families. They're often invisible. They're invisible to their governments. They're invisible to the people around them. And so what I do every day is about taking those people and making them visible, making sure that their voices are heard, making sure that we are able to ensure that they go from being invisible to visible. In fact, around 20% of the poorest people in the world, 20% of the poorest people in the world, that's 1.4 billion people, over half of them do not exist. They don't exist in official data. Their births are never registered. They have no identity. They're not visible. They don't exist. Now, if you don't exist, if you don't exist in official data, you can't open a bank account, you can't own land, you can't buy a house. You will struggle to access basic services and you will certainly struggle to contribute to the formal economy. If you're invisible, you do not share in the progress that the rest of us, the rest of us are able to share. This global progress around us. So the poorest 20% of people continuously get left further and further and further behind. But yet we tolerate this. 
We tolerate this, we accept it, we assume poverty is intractable. It's unfortunate, but it's a fallout of our system. It's not something I can do anything about. It's somebody else's problem to fix over there. Well, I'm making it my problem. And I believe, and I know, there's no shortage of resources in this world. There's no shortage of money to deal with poverty. This is not a question of a lack of financial resources. This is a question of a lack of political will. And standing here today with you all, one of the things I'm really aware of, we're in the halls of power. And this House of Commons, House of Lords, the Houses of Parliament, have seen incredible transformative change occur. Change that at that time would have seemed unsurmountable. But yet, we had the abolition of slavery. We had the emancipation of women. We had the welfare bill pass through these halls that lifted millions and millions of Britons out of poverty and created a healthy, educated middle class. Change is possible. And once again, we have a unique opportunity to make change happen at a global scale. This is not just my vision alone around ending poverty. This is a global vision. This is all of our vision. This is enshrined in the Sustainable Development Goals. The world's nations came together in 2015 and established the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And the SDG agenda, at the heart of this agenda, is ending poverty and building a much more sustainable and equal world. We have until 2030 to achieve this vision. That leaves us 12 years. I don't believe we need the full 12 years. I think we can do it. We can do it before 2030. Why? Because as I said, we have enough resources in the system to really eradicate poverty. Unfortunately, we're making decisions based on data that doesn't exist at the moment. We're making poor decisions with often with bad data or unavailable data. And what we really need is data on people, people who are the poorest people. We need to take these people and make them visible. We need to give them a voice and we need to make sure that they are seen by the, those people who are making the decisions. So disaggregated data, local data on people is essential to end poverty. And I can hear you thinking, data, is that really going to solve the problem? I really do believe it is. And I believe this for two reasons. Firstly, if we can count people, we will know who they are, we will know where they are, we can actually target them, we can reach them, and we can lift them out of poverty. And secondly, we need to leverage this data. So we need to create the data on people, but then we need to leverage the data. Raw data in and of itself will not eradicate poverty, but what we do with that data will. And so, by leveraging the data, telling compelling data stories, and putting them in the hands of people who can make decisions with it, we will see transformative change occur. Let me give you a quick example. So, a couple of years ago, I met a very inspirational man, a chief of a, of a village in Western Kenya, who was known as a tweeting chief. Now, he would make use of anything that he could get his hands on to be able to try to better the lives of his, of his people. And he was known as a tweeting chief because he used Twitter to communicate and mobilise his citizens. And the tweeting chief, when we met him once, he was like, these SDGs, really interested in them, but tell me a little bit more, how can I use them to improve the lives of people that I am responsible for? And so myself and our organisation, Development Initiatives, and a local partner, Open Institute, who were leading most of this work, we came together to actually create data on every single person in his, in his jurisdiction. 
so we could learn about their needs and understand how the SDGs could address those needs. And two things happened. Two things happened as a result of this exercise. First of all, we realised there were 5,000 more people in his jurisdiction than, we had, than he had known because they weren't captured in official data. And secondly, we also learnt that the most poorest and vulnerable people were really affected by a lack of clean water. So what the tweeting chief did, he tweeted. And lo and behold, two weeks later, a charity in the US sent water filters for every single household in his village. And secondly, he was able to mobilise funding from the government to actually build a local health clinic right in the near vicinity of his people. And this is where we can see these small but significant examples of how data comes together with these data stories and people can make decisions to really have transformative change in people's lives. But we need to do this at a much greater scale. We need to make millions of people visible. Millions of people who are currently invisible need to be made visible. And so we need to work at speed and scale to count these people and make them visible, to give them a voice. And in this room, I look around and I am slightly intimidated. You're all very impressive looking. <laughs> I look around and I can see that we've got people here who have incredible networks, who have incredible access to technology, systems, ideas, innovations. And if we all came together, if we all came together, we could actually create data on some of the hardest to reach people. And we could make the people who are currently invisible, visible. Now, I often think back to that little boy that I met on the train who was sweeping away the monsoon rain. I often think back to him and I think about him and think, has he made it this far? And if he has made it this far, he'll be in his 20s now. And maybe he has children of his own. But maybe they are also invisible. Maybe they are also not counted. And I couldn't do much for him that day. But maybe now I can do something for his children. I can make them visible. I can make sure they count. And I can help create a better future for them. For the first time, we do truly have the ability, we have the tools and the ability to transform some of the poorest people's lives and end poverty in our lifetime. Change is possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Just incredible. Just incredible. Thank you.